said God cannot lie He promised to save His people He never changed His mind Today He still calls them my people My people, my people Well hi there and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Hooray! And I will greet you on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself in the name of Jesus Christ. We're blessed that you can join us and be part of, part of the Bible study. And again, I, I do want to remind you that we welcome any comments, suggestions, or questions that you might have. And you can write to us at office at Bible Talk. And we'd love to just hear from you and hear what you're... BibleTalk.com. Did I say that? You, didn't, you, didn't, you left off the dot com. I left off the dot com. Oh, shame on me. Office at BibleTalk.com. Write to us. Okay. Um, all of this entire series, the seven churches, and this is our 26th part. So we've done about 25 hours in this. Is available online on the site, and we'll stay there. Indefinitely. Indefinitely. As long as the Lord wills. Amen. So you can go back and review it. You can invite others to go watch it and take part in it. You could use it as your own Bible studies. You know, sit together, get a group together and watch it and have a discussion. That works too. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Well, anyhow, we're just glad we can be together. And uh, so we're, we're starting. Last week we did uh, the introduction to the church mm. at Laodicea. Yeah. And if you had seen that, you know that I use that word church loosely. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll start uh, going through it verse by verse. Okay. And this is the last of the seven churches. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but before we start that, I'm going to ask Brother Mark here to ask God's blessing on our time together. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for the ability to get together. Yes, and we Lord. just thank you for your word. And please make apparent to us, which is your will, what is in your word and what we need for our lives this week. Amen. 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 Okay, so we're going to go through this verse by verse, and we're going to start, we're in chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this. Again, I just want to kind of state the obvious. Jesus, this letter is from Jesus. It's not the writing of John. He is transmitting what he is hearing, right. all right, while on the island, imprisoned on the island of Patmos. So Jesus starts this letter by saying, he, that, introducing himself as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. You know, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, if you doubt the truth of Jesus Christ, either you, uh, the only thing I can say is you've never talked to him. You don't know him. Right. Because when you meet Jesus Christ, and that's what true Christianity is about, it's about a relationship with Jesus that leads to that, makes possible, that relationship with the Father. You, you know that he's the truth, Amen. right? There's no doubts. And that's important here, particularly in a church like Laodicea, which basically you'll see is challenging that fact, right? Okay. And one other thing I just want to point out, he says that he's the beginning of the creation of God. Mm. Now, the, the reason that Jesus would say that, if you go back to the Gospel of John, in the first chapter, John, John wrote and said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Okay, so it's not like, it's not like okay, Jesus is the first thing that God the Father created. It is that he is the beginning of all creation. Every, all creation originates with Jesus Christ, the Word. Because God the Father has spoken into existence, right? So let's move along. And the first thing he says, I'm going to read verses 15 and 16. Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth, spit you out of my mouth, vomit you out of my mouth. Um, I, I think 
the best translation is vomit. Yes. I mean, it's true like, objectile vomit. Yeah, it, it, it's just if you. But if you really want to understand that, what Jesus is saying is that this is a quote unquote church that makes him sick, sick to his stomach. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason we started this study long ago, half a year ago, was that we're trying to find those things that are pleasing to God and the things that are displeasing mm -hmm. to him. And the, the seven churches is a good place to see that. Yes. And you cannot, I mean, there you can't measure greater displeasure than Jesus is expressing about a people that call themselves Christians, a church, mm -hmm. here. He's saying, you're, you're so bad that you make me want to vomit. You make me, that's, how harsh that's is very that? very graphic. Well, you know what? God's word is not afraid to be graphic, no, all right? Um, yeah, if it offends your sensibilities, well, then get over it. I mean, that's all I can say to you. Get over it. Jesus Christ is real. He's, he's down to earth. He speaks the truth, all right? Why? Because they're lukewarm. They're compromised. They are churchgoers who are compromised. Think about this. It's like what you said last week. They're hot on Sunday and cold on Monday. Well, that's, that's one way to get good and lukewarm. Yeah. You know, uh, cold water is good. Yeah. Okay? It's useful. Hot water is good. is good. It's useful. Lukewarm or tepid water is basically good for nothing. It's comfortable. Well... That's that's a, a it dangerous take, zone to be in, a comfort zone. In a, in a sense, it takes some kind of effort to uh, get something hot or get something cold, oh. but it takes no effort to be tepid, to be lukewarm. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it makes me think of, because when we think of this, we think of water, right? Yeah, yeah. Christ being the living waters. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of like water that becomes stagnant, mm -hmm. all right? Because it just sits there and does nothing, and it just... It's green and scummy and useless. It's, it's yucky. As a matter of fact, tepid water, lukewarm water, is often in, used to induce That's vomiting. Right. That's right. right? Yeah. Think about this now. I, I just want to talk about what it means to be lukewarm. Mm -hmm. In the Gospel of Mark, it says that one of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognized that he, Jesus, had, had answered them well. And he asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's Mark 12, verses 28 through 30. The Greek word holos that's translated there as all, as well as the Hebrew word um, over in Deuteronomy, where that, which is Jesus is quoting from that passage, that, that's coal. They mean all. That's that's what they mean. I mean, there's, it's not. You can't get around this. Although it seems that we strive to get around it. The foremost commandment of God is to love Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That doesn't, that doesn't leave room for anybody else. It doesn't leave room for anybody else. You know, and that's why David had prayed. And this is Psalm 86. He said, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. All right. When the people of God allowed their, their compromise to run rampant, and this happened over and over and over. Okay. It's, I mean, it's not new in the church of Laodicea by any means. Okay. God always sent his prophets. Yes. Not, not the prophets to say, oh, you're so great. God's going to... He, the, purpose, the primary purpose of a prophet is to call people back into a right relationship with the Lord when they are not in that right relationship. Mm -hmm. So just give me, let me give you a couple of examples. Some, I'm sure you know this, like this is from Joshua. Mm -hmm. Joshua 24, 15. Joshua gathered the people of God and said, if it's disagreeable in your sight, to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which are beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land, whose land you're living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen is right. And then later on, 
you know, Elijah is the prophet, all right? And the people of God are living in, in incredible disobedience. Mm -hmm. The king and queen, the, the queen Jezebel is literally supporting the false prophets of Baal. Mm -hmm. So when Elijah came back into the land, it says in 1 Kings 18, Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. He's saying, how long are you going to be between those two? That's what, that's what lukewarm is. Yeah. They're neither hot nor cold. Right. They're, so, they're, they're trying to stay in the middle. Right. And you know, it's interesting because literally in the Hebrew here, the image in, in the Hebrew, Hebrew is a, a language that gave, gives great imagery. Yes. Right? Yes. So true. this is a picture of like a little bird on, on two branches on a tree mm -hmm. walking out. You know, and branches on a tree kind of separate as you go. So what are you saying? It's like you, you can't stay divided. You keep you keep going in that direction. You gotta choose. You've got to choose one or the other, or you're gonna fall down to destruction, right? It is clear that we're not to seek answers to the to the trials, tribulations, problems, whatever, the questionings of our lives. It says, Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord. Who exec execute a plan, but not mine, and make an alliance, but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who proceed down to Egypt without consulting me, to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh, and seek shelter in the shadow of Egypt. That's Isaiah 30. So what he's saying is, it's like, what happens is the people of God, and this is where compromise begins to blossom, is when they think that the world has the answers and they go back to, because that's what Egypt represented yes, here. Yes. That's, you know, go back to the world. Christianity is a radical religion. Well, it should be. Christianity is the radical religion. If you understand radical, literally means the root, okay? Everything else is imitations and counterfeits, okay? How radical is this? When the Apostle James writes in James 4, 4 and says, You adulteresses. Mm -hmm. Now he's speaking to Christians. Yes. And he says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's very powerful. How, how much more radical? I mean, you know, you can quote, too, it says, well, if you love the world and the things of the world, you have not the love of the Father. And people say, well, I don't love the things of the world. This says, don't even be a friend. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. We are here, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago in the study, as, as sojourners and strangers, aliens, passing through, okay, in the world, but not of it. What will it take for us as Christians to get to the place where we can cry out as it does in Psalm 73 25 whom have I in heaven but you and beside you I desire nothing on earth not not just a little to say there's nothing on earth that holds attraction for me the only thing that I want is the Lord more of him, more of him, more of him. What does it take? To get, you know what it takes? It takes a heart that is totally, completely devoted to the Lord, a mind set on the Lord. Oh. And you know you're under attack. You are under attack every time you turn on a radio or a television or drive down and see a billboard. You are constantly being besieged by that adversary. Mm -hmm who goes about as a roaring lion, who is always trying to get you off that path of righteousness, Distract to ensnare you with the trap that he has set, with the world and the things of the world. He has nothing else to offer. No. The devil can't offer you anything but the, the things of the world, right? It's the garbage. Which leads to, in, in Revelation 3.17, when it says, because this is when I said it says Jesus is saying to this this assembly, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, 
What? Talk about strong statements. My goodness. This, this quote-unquote church is boasting about what it has. And yet it is completely blind to the fact that what it doesn't have it's Jesus is Christ. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the presence of God. He stands outside. That's what it says in 3.20. He stands at the door. He's outside. They are desolate. They, they are desolate. But here's a group of, and I put big quotes around this, this, here's a group of believers, I don't know what they believe in, and they're saying they got everything. And yet they don't have Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, you know what you have? Nothing. Do you believe that? I mean, this is what because it's going to boil down to. They're not focusing on Jesus. Well, They're focusing on the things of the world. On the world and the things of the yeah. world. And the unfortunate part is, there's somebody in that church, church who's standing behind a pulpit and teaching. And his teaching is not lining up with... Here's what Jesus said. For whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels shall save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Mark 8, 35-38. Well, listen, these are strong <laughs> statements. You know, maybe you've convinced yourself. Maybe you have allowed the world to convince you that there's not an end coming. That, you know, that somehow, well, that somehow Jesus on. is tolerant yeah. of, of this compromise and this disobedience to his commandment. You've been lied to if you believe that, okay? You know, I, I can remember, I don't know, it was quite a, a number of years ago, I was over in Oldham, England, and I was, I was teaching, and I, I don't remember what, you know, most of it is kind of spontaneous. And, there was a, I was in this church, and I said to them, "If you had to describe Christianity in one word, what word would you, you know, what would you, how would you describe Christianity in one word?" This is this is not a trick question, but no. if I said that to you, what would you say? Love. Mark says love. There's a lot of good words you can use, but the word that the Spirit of God had put upon my heart at that moment was, if I were to describe Christianity in one word, that word would be dangerous. That word is dangerous. It is dangerous to the flesh. There is no doubt that it is dangerous to the flesh. It is life. It is spirit. It is joy. It is love. It is peace. It is all these things. But if you don't understand that following Jesus Christ is dangerous, that you know the song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Then how come you are always saying, How are you? You'd always say safe. Because I am. So it's not dangerous. Well, no, no, you know, when you were safe. Know, when you know. No. <laughs> you're in the palm of his hand. It's dangerous to the flesh. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very it's dangerous. dangerous. Very. So it's not if, if it's only dangerous to the flesh, it says, do not fear those who can kill the body. But the problem is, you, you know, that's easy for you to say. Yes. Yeah. Because we're sitting here, and I, I would say that the three of us are in agreement, and I pray that you are, that we are spiritual beings, yes. and our our focus is supposed to be spiritual. We're supposed to have our eyes fixed on Jesus and our minds set on the things above. Right. But the simple fact of the matter is that's not what it is evident in much of the church today and certainly not evident at all in the church of Laodicea. Right. So true Christianity, you know, I started to say, what a friend we have in Jesus. Well, we've made an enemy. We have an enemy. We have an adversary. Right? But as Mark just said, Jesus said, listen, don't fear those who can kill the body. Okay? I, I'm going to say this again, and I, I ask you to think about what I'm saying. Don't just reject it or even, don't even accept it just without giving it thought. Testing it. Without testing it. There are many, many places in the world today, some places that we've been, where it is physically dangerous to be a professing Christian. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I mean, we, we've been in East Africa, West Africa. We've traveled in, in the Mideast. We've traveled, you know, in, in 
a lot of places where there is great and grave danger. Mm -hmm. To the flesh. To the flesh. But I honestly believe, and I'm going to say this, I honestly believe that Christians in um, the United States of America are in greater danger than those Christians in Pakistan, Christians in Syria, Christians in Iraq and Iran. And you can say, well, what, how can that possibly be? You know why? Because we are under attack by the devil here. Yes. Day by day by day. The problem is we don't even recognize it. Mm. And that's more dangerous when, than when the, the attack is over and you're prepared for it. Because you can lose your soul. Yes. Okay. Well, it's, not, it's not dangerous to the flesh. It's comfortable. And you become, well, and you become complacent. Well, and that's dangerous to the spirit. Yeah. That's the whole point. That's, that's extremely dangerous. Um, it's like um, these guys. You know, we're, we don't have, need anything. We have everything. Let me, yeah, let, let's just talk about this a minute, right? If we go on to, to verse 18, Jesus said, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may become rich, and white garments that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and I sat to anoint your eyes that you may see. Mm -hmm. What do you think the greatest tool, weapon of the devil is? Weapon? Yeah, what I mean what what weapons? I mean listen, do not for a moment think that I take this lightly when I tell you that there are Christians, you know, they're, they're half of Nigeria is a Christian yes. quote unquote nation yes. and it's half Muslim and a whole bunch of pagan too, but that's another story. In those areas where Boko Haram is is operating and seems to be operating fairly freely, or over in Kenya which has been attacked by radical Muslims from down in, you know, coming down the coast from Somalia or, or so many other places, uh, you know, th think about, there are Christians who are facing ISIS, Yes. okay? Their weapons are swords and guns and bombs and, but I said, America is dangerous. What's the weapon? I think one of the greatest weapons that Satan uses to attack the people of God is prosperity. Okay. Riches, wealth. I really do. Mm -hmm. And it, see, now the, 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 the horror here is that so much of the church today is preaching, prosperity. God wants you rich. And they are preaching this prosperity message that I'm telling you is a weapon of the, of the devil. Okay? I'm not going to sit here and say God doesn't want you to have anything. No, God wants you to have Him. And God wants you to be focused oh, with him. focused on Him with all your heart. That's right. With all your might, with all your spirit, with all your strength. All right? Everything about you. Can you say, only you, only you, Lord, have I have, and only you do I desire? Mm -hmm. Or are you going someplace and they're creating this, stirring up desire for the world and the things of the world? Buy from me gold, refined by fire, that you may become rich. Now remember, this is a church that has heard a prosperity message. Yes. They're doing well. And they're because preaching they, a prosperity Well, message. listen, somehow they got to the place where they're saying, we're rich, we have need of nothing. Mm -hmm. That's what they're saying, mm -hmm. right? And Jesus said that they, you should buy gold from him, refined by fire, so that you can, can become rich. He told them that they were poor and wretched and naked. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a difference of, I was going to say a difference of opinion. Jesus doesn't have opinions. He has the truth. He has the truth. He is the truth. We should buy from him. Now, you know, it says, it says in Isaiah, come, buy without cost, mm -hmm. right? But the simple fact of the matter is, Jesus is saying here that that church should buy from him. He taught that we are to count the cost. In Luke 14, 28, he says, don't start something without counting the cost. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and he's talking there about choose when we choose to follow him. Understand that there is a cost. Salvation is the free gift of God, not of works of sin and boast. But if you think that following Jesus Christ doesn't come with a cost, you haven't been reading the word. Mm -hmm. How about verses like this? 
Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus said that in Luke 14, 27. He also said in Luke 14, 33, so then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. You think there's no cost? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh -huh. Okay. Jesus, in Matthew 16, he said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That is radical. When you talk about wealth, I mean the standard of wealth through all of mankind's history basically has been gold. Yes. That, that's a fair statement, right? Let, let me start by this by saying that life is always a contest between the world and the word. Right. It's a contest, a conflict between the flesh and the spirit. Right? Absolutely. It's two, two things. There's the flesh, there's the spirit, yes. there's the word, there's the world. Jesus Christ, and I've said this um, so many times here before, let me never hurts to say this again. If you want to understand Christianity, normal Christianity, if you want to understand Jesus Christ, don't just read, study the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, yes. 6, and 7, right? And in that, in Matthew 6, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew 6, 24, right? The wealth of the world is Satan's great weapon. It is, has always been represented by gold. Yes. Yes. And nowhere in Scripture is the world's go gold more praised than Ophir. Mm -hmm. All right? <clears throat> All through the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, it talks about the gold of Ophir, which was just considered to be the finest gold, right? In the book of Job, listen to this. It says, if you return to the Almighty, you will be restored. If you remove unrighteousness far from your tent and place your gold in the dust and the gold of Ophir among the stones of the brooks, then the Almighty will be your gold and choice silver to you. For then you will delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. Job 22, verses 23 to 26. <clears throat> He's saying, you know, if you are willing to give up the gold of the world, he will... Come. Become your gold. All right? right. Persecution and tribulation certainly is an attack on believers. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And but we often seem to overlook or minimize the warning of Jesus about the other tactic of the enemy, which I think is perhaps even more dangerous: wealth and riches. Yes. In, this, in, in a parable that you should know, the parable of the sower yes. and the seed, yes. considering the fact. That Jesus said that if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand any of them. All right? Jesus said, and others are the ones on whom the seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word and the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Mark 4, verses 18 and 19. Jesus is warned about this tactic of the, this this weapon of the enemy that's the deceitfulness of riches okay satan actually thought and, and that's probably based on his experience with mankind that the pull of riches was so strong that it could sway even jesus himself oh, because he tried that tempted. in one of his temptations and one of the temptations it says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan was a prosperity preacher, still is. He's the first one, right? What do you think he said to, to, to the woman in the garden? When he's saying, hey, just eat the, the fruit that Jesus, you know, that God said, don't eat. And you'll have this. You'll be like God. All right. 
There's so much warning in Scripture about riches, a desire for riches, all right? It's a desire. It doesn't say the love of money is the root of all evil. It says that the, it doesn't say money is the root of all evil, rather. It says that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, all right? Paul wrote to the Colossians. Now, remember, when he wrote to the Colossians, he said, I want you to take this letter and make sure that the lay of the scenes here, okay? He said to the Colossians, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and listen, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. He said, make sure you read that to delay your decisions. And you know that this is so true because of the fact that if you ask anybody, you know, what the answer to any problem they have in money. their life, it's money. Money, money, money. That's their first it is. line of That's why you got to understand when Jesus said you can't serve two masters, God and mammon, and mammon is, you know, worldly wealth. Right, right. right? And, and by the way, you know, we've done a study on the Sermon on the Mount, which is available on our website here, by the way. But it's, it's important to understand that people think that money will serve them. Jesus said, slave it's the other way around. You can't serve two masters because money will be your master. You'll wind up serving the money, not the other way around, all right? Okay, Paul also taught Timothy, his son in the faith, and instructed him what he was taught to pass along to others, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, but those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare, yes. and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Mm -hmm. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Mm -hmm. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, perseverance, and gentleness. 1 Timothy 6, 9-11. You see, he's saying that this is a tactic that causes people to fall away from the faith. And if you fall away from the faith, you're dead for eternity. It's not like your body just got killed and, wow, you're present with the Lord. You're dead for eternity. So this goes on and on and on. I mean, there's so much teaching in Scripture about this. So much teaching in Scripture and so little teaching from the pulpits. That's right. So, They'll have listen, to answer for in them. love, and I'm, you know, the Word of God says we're to speak the truth in love. In love, I tell you, I, I, I'm sounding a warning. Alarm. Sound the alarm. I'm sounding an alarm. Because this is the picture, this Laodicea is a picture of the last church on earth. All right? Mm -hmm. And is it, it is a church that is boasting filled with pride about what they have. We're rich, we have need of nothing. And Jesus says, you're poor, you're wretched, you're naked. And they're embracing the world. It says in Hebrews 13, 5, make sure that your, your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself, Jesus himself, has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Because he is the answer. Not money, not riches, not wealth. You, if you believe that it is, you know, I hear Christians, this, this may sound strange. You have a problem, you pray God will give me the money to take care of it. You're still answer. trusting in money. That's right. It's not the answer. It's, you know, it, it's, it's so easy to be deceived. This is the way we've been trained. By the world. That's right. There are too many warnings to recite them all here. I mean, that's, that's obvious. But it should become clear that the Word teaches us to seek God, Amen. not wealth. Amen. The Word, am, the Word, Jesus, the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, said this, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Matthew 5, 6. Mm. The simple truth is, the leech, as it says in Proverbs, has, has three doors. Give, 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 and they're never satisfied. I, I was actually watching a news show this morning. Mm. He, he and, that. and well, no, it was interesting because the the fellow who is the um, MC, the MC, the host of the show, who happens to be a multimillionaire, 
Somebody said to him, and I don't remember what the 20, context was, yeah. said that, you know, well, they, oh, I know, he's talking about a newscaster who's in ethical problem right now. And he says, well, he could, should just take off because he's got plenty right. of money. And this host said nobody ever has plenty of money. That's right. Uh, because it's always more, more, more. Right. I had occasion to, uh, when I went, when we come back from Belize, I owned a company. I had started a company. And one of my clients was a, a very, very wealthy man. Uh, I mean, a multi, 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 multi millionaire. And as a matter of fact, we were living in Naples, Florida, where he lived uh, at the time. And he had asked me to bring one, one of my technical guys and fly out to California uh, to, to check something out in, in one of the company's CEO. So he invited us out and he flew we, with him. We went out, this, the fellow that worked for me, Doug and myself, we flew out on his Learjet. Mm -hmm. And we flew to Sacramento, California and did this work and then we all flew back. And as we were flying back, I was sitting talking to this fellow. And you know, we had been come fairly close. And all he did was complain about, I mean, this guy had, I mean. He had another plane too. Oh, he had a 727. Yeah. 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 But we decided to take the Lear because it's just a you know short short hop, yeah. short hop across the country. But the entire ride back, you know, we're in this conversation, and he kept talking about the deals he lost. I mean, this guy he had so much wealth. To me, it's like almost inconceivable. Mm -hmm. But he's talking about the billion dollar he deal lost. he lost. He's chasing the and the illusion. It, it fascinated me to watch this guy who had basically everything that the world had to offer. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't satisfied. And he wasn't happy. And he wasn't satisfied. And meanwhile, I mean, we had just come back from, from Belize where we lived with no running water and electricity. And we had been content. Absolutely. Satisfied. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The things of the world will never, ever satisfy you. If you believe it, you, you have believed a lie. I mean, that's how simple it is. That's how true it is. You're chasing after an illusion, and you'll be disillusioned. So I, I say all of this to get to this question. If the Word made flesh disdains wealth, and Satan preaches desire for wealth, who had the congregation, the assembly of Laodicea, chosen to listen to? Mm -hmm. There you go. The best that that preacher was doing was not teaching the Word. Well, the the worst was he was lying to them. I can tell you who they chose not to listen to because he's not inside. They weren't yeah. listening to Jesus. They weren't listening to Jesus. So this this sounds, you know, you'd like to say, well, there's, there's, there's Jesus and then there's Satan and there's this great big gray area in between. No, no there's no gray area. Black it's either green. black or white. There's no gray. Jesus okay. said you are either for me or against, or against me. So if they are not listening to Jesus... He's outside the door of this entire church. Listen, I, you know, I've grown up, I'm 70, going on 72 years old here. I've been around the block once or twice. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a religion where, you know, you respected the man of the cloth, mm -hmm. right? The collar. The collar, yeah. yes, the, the right reverence. And the, uh, why do we not believe what Jesus said when he warned us in that Sermon on the Mount? and said, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Matthew 7, 15. Do we not believe that? Do we not believe that these people are in the church? I, you know, and I hear these guys, I hear, I hear people, I have heard people who I know are spewing filth yes. over the body of Christ. Yes. And they say, well, and when, when they are called to test, they say, well, the word goes, is touch not my anointing. Yes. You're not anointed, not, not by the God that I serve. That's right. Christianity is radical. Jesus, you will never meet anybody more radical than Jesus Christ. His, his commitment to the Father was total. Right. All, all, all. There was nothing in reserve. Not my will, but thy will be done. How do we get to this place where we can say, like Jesus Christ, not my will, not what I want, because the only thing that I want now, the only thing I desire is you, Lord. You know how you can get there? By making a choice. 
by making a choice. It's not about how you feel. It's about how you choose. Choose you this day who you will serve. It's time for you to realize that and make the right choice because these are indeed the perilous last days that Paul wrote to Timothy about. These are the days where the church, where true believers are under an incredible attack. And I am not talking about somebody trying to come and cut your head off. I am talking somebody who is coming along to try and make it real in your life that in those perilous last days, you will become a lover of money. Yes. That you will become a lover of self. That you will become a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God. That's what he wants. That's what he wants, and that's what he's doing a great job at. How do you get against that? You choose. Because then, it's not about you, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It is about you choosing God and trusting in him to complete and do the work that he has promised. No promise that he has promised has failed to come to pass. No, no, no. If you will place yourself in his hands where no man can snatch you out, God will put a hedge of protection around you. But it means that you will have to do what Jesus said. You will have to learn to deny yourself. You will have to learn to turn away, not towards Egypt, and turn, turn towards God for the answer to every problem, every situation that you have in your life. Absolutely. It becomes a choice day by day. And he said, I have set before you life and death. Choose life. Choose life. Thank you, Lord. Do not be part of the Church of Laodicea. It can look very, very attractive. Very tempting. It can look very, very tempting mm -hmm. if you are looking through natural eyes. But if you are looking through things and appraising them spiritually through the Word of God, you will see the lie. You will see the deception. You will see the danger. And you will not stray from that straight and narrow path that is Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Father, I just pray, Lord God, that your spirit, who you sent to lead us into all truth, will draw us closer and closer to you. That we will operate in, in the strength of your spirit, not in our own strength, Lord God. Because, like you said to Paul, your grace is sufficient. And power is perfected in weakness. So we will just place ourselves and trust in you, Lord. That you will, that you will keep us fast steadfast in these perilous last days and that day by day moment by moment hour by hour we would choose you i praise you and thank you father for your grace for your mercy for your love in jesus name <coughs> well bless you, jesus. it's been a blessing to be with you again once again Amen. and as we come to a close i want invite you back for the next one mm -hmm. but I know that before we go Alice wants to tell you Jesus loves you a oh. lot <laughs> hallelujah till next time be used by the Lord our God for the glory of his name amen, amen.